Hi, I'm Matthew McCabe. Welcome to Miracle Voices. Each episode, my co-host Judy Scutch Whitson and I will be delving into stories of forgiveness, healing, and transformation that have come about from integrating the principles of the book A Course in Miracles. If you want to learn more about A Course in Miracles, visit www.acim.org. If you'd like to visit the Miracle Voices site, please go to www.miraclevoices.org. Now here's your program. Judy, welcome to another edition of Miracle Voices. How are you doing today? Just fine, Matt, and I'm really looking forward to us playing together. Yeah, and we're going to discuss everybody's favorite topic, the dentist. I understand you have a forgiveness story involving a dentist. Tell us about it. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's no too trite forgiveness story. Uh, all miracles are equal. None is larger or smaller than another. And so I picked this story just to show that it's not necessarily other people we need to forgive, but ourselves, primarily ourselves. Well, this happened a few years ago when I was told that I need to have a tooth pulled. And uh, being on in years, I wasn't too delighted with this. Uh, Also, I don't think it's the most pleasant experience we go through, even though we know we're going to be under anesthesia. So I asked a friend of mine to go with me just so I'd have a drive and couldn't drive back home. And she did. And this is another fellow student of a course. In fact, for those of you who know, it's Emmanuel Rosenthal, who has been a student of the course for many, many years and is also married to Dr. Robert Rosenthal, who is our co-president of the Foundation for Inner Peace. Um, I picked Emmanuel because she's so kind. <laughs> didn't want a person who didn't care. And on the way there, we were talking and I realized I was very uptight. And when we got to the dentist, which was a little early, I said to her, I need some help. I can't go in like this. I'm terrified. Would you sit with me and hold my hand? And she said, of course. And so we both closed our eyes. I never asked what she was thinking. I just assumed It would be about the same thing. Let me perceive this differently. I would like to shift my attitude from love to fear, from fear to love. And uh, while sitting and doing that, I was very conscious of how fearful I was. And I was very conscious that the antidote to fear is always love. So by the time five minutes or so had passed, I felt great. But I felt more than just content. I felt great. I mean, I really felt happy. And I went in and I registered and even someone said to me, oh boy, you're cheery today. No one's ever cheery who comes to the dentist. And I said, well, I'm feeling very happy. And I went in, brand new surgeon, never had seen him before. Young, well, of course, everyone's younger than I am, but he was particularly young. And I must have greeted him with a great deal of enthusiasm because he looked up and he looked at me strangely and he said, um, are you my next patient? And I said, yes. He said, for an extraction? And I said, yes. He said, well, I sort of doubted it because you came in with a smile. Nobody ever comes in here with a smile. And I said, it must be because of their fear. He said, oh, I'm sure it is because of their fear. I said, well, maybe they just need a little love. And he thought for a second and he said, you know, that never occurred to me. He said, I like people and I don't think that I am off-putting, but I never consciously think maybe I'll give them some love. But you seem to have it now, so how do you give love? So we got into a discussion about how he could give his patients love. Well, we talked for about 40 minutes. I had no sense of time going by, nor did he. But we were in such a state of oneness and enthralled them with each other that it was absolutely delightful. And suddenly he looked at his watch and said, oh, my God, I have another patient in 20 minutes. He said, come on, sit down in the chair. We'll get this over with. So I said, sure. And I got an anesthetic and the whole thing was over in maybe five minutes with no pain. And I came out of it grinning. And he said, wow, if each of my patients can have some love from me before I do this. And this is the result I get. I'm all for this. How do you study this? <laughs> I said, well, there are many ways to, but I happen to have a particular book. I want that book. So I walked out of his office 
with his email and his home address to be able to send him a copy of A Course in Miracles. And I had no pain. Sometimes after an extraction, I would have pain, sometimes for as long as two weeks. But the medication he gave me, I didn't need to use. And I went out and I said to Emmanuel, oh boy, are you good? It worked. And she looked at me and she smiled because she knows better. She said, you know, I didn't do anything. So there's a little story about what happens when, number one, you recognize that you're fearful. Number two, you choose not to be fearful. And number three, you ask the Holy Spirit to change your perception. You know, I have a very similar story to that. Um, and I, I called you shortly after this happened. Um, I was traveling and uh, I was inspired by your story that you told me about how you got the grease on your hand and how Bill Thetford helped you with that. And I was taking down this about five foot hot, tall, um, it was like a, a, this little rack for drying your clothes, but it was this German made one that was really strong and thick steel. And uh, I went to the bottom of it to press um, this little lever to collapse it. And when I pressed it, it worked so well that it instantly all collapsed right onto my, my finger and it closed and it locked. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And I'm standing I'm by myself trying to figure out how to get it unlocked with one finger. And eventually I did, but it was about a minute that it was on there. And uh, it instantly was swollen and purple and just nasty looking. And uh, I just sat down, just started breathing deeply. And I remember that story you told me. And five minutes later, it was almost recognizable. The swelling wasn't there. It was a little pink. Um, and But then, you know, a couple hours after that, it was 95% better. I could hardly, I, I it was a little stiff, but it looked nothing at all like, which you're, you know, you would have expected from how terribly, terribly nasty it looked after the event. So I know exactly what you're talking about. And and, and I learned from your lesson there, um, not your dentist lesson, but the other one from your, the story about the grease on uh, your hand. So how propitious. <laughs> yeah. So glad to hear that. Well, you know, we all have these moments that we live through where we can correct the mistakes we've made in the past by thinking that we are bodies and nothing more. The power of the mind is so strong that it is incomprehensible, I think, to us as small-minded, ego-driven beings. Yeah. Uh, all we have to do, and it's simple, Matthew, isn't it? You've demonstrated just that in your story. It's a simple thing to do. You have to ask for help because it calms you down and only that inner voice knows how to help you. So therefore, the body is being affected by what we're thinking. And if we're in alignment with the Holy Spirit, those what people call miracles, the outcome of forgiveness, those miracles happen. And they happen basically to change our minds so that we remember, and the next time we'll remember, and the next time we'll remember, and we have are confronted with every, every day, perhaps, we're confronted with situations that seem dangerous to the body, and we just need to remember, let go of the fear and ask for help. It's as simple as that. I think yours is more, in the ego's mind, more dramatic, because you actually got hurt, yeah. and you actually saw it disappear. I I did it pre-hurt. <laughs> <laughs> So it doesn't sound as exciting, but it's all the same. We know that it's all the same. The Course tells us very clearly that forgiveness is the only function, at the only function meaningful in time, the only function meaningful in time. We think we have so many different functions, and a lot of them seem meaningful indeed, but the Course is telling us that the only function meaningful in time is forgiveness. Uh, you say, what about my children? What about this? What about that? Only the ego asks questions, but rather to reflect upon that. Because while you're in time, there certainly is still much to do. And each must do what is allotted him. For on his part does all the plan depend. 
Each of us has something to do. Each of us has an assignment. And dependent on that plan is the whole sonship recognizing its oneness. It's nice, number one, to know that we have only one function and it's forgiveness. And it's even nicer to know that as we see ourselves in the world and we have so much, it looks like we have to do, but the Holy Spirit's guidance will pick what is our particular part of the plan because the whole plan depends upon us all doing that. And when we get into these thoughts, and it's not necessarily easy to comprehend at once. The words are easy enough. Of course, they're spoken in our language. But to actually get what is saying, I think, takes some help from the Holy Spirit, too. So when I run into something fairly new in the course, after 46 years, <laughs> I, I ask the Holy Spirit to explain it to me. And then I'll get sort of an visceral feeling. Oh, oh, of course. How come I didn't remember that? Of course, I know what this is. Uh, I was telling Matthew something about shortcuts uh, a little while ago. And I said that I was reading something again last night in the text with another shortcut that I totally forgot about. And it was whenever something comes up that is troubling you, and you realize you're not at peace, you turn to the Holy Spirit and you say, decide this for me. Decide this for me. It all depends upon what decision you make. Do you make the decision for the ego, which is going to be pain, suffering, chaos, maybe a little bit of happiness that seems happy once in a while, but basically pretty much a mess? Or do you decide, decide for the Holy Spirit? If you choose to decide for the Holy Spirit, you don't need a long prayer. You don't need two hours of meditation. All you need to do is say, decide this for me. And I said that since I remember that last night, after having reread it, I don't know how many times, but I finally remembered it. I started today with decide this for me. Decide everything today for me. I do not want to make a decision alone. And that's sort of a blanket statement because it shows your intention, your willingness. And that, of course, is a key element in studying the Course, our willingness to accept who we are, our willingness to change our minds, our willingness to ask for higher help. And put all together, it just plain works. Yeah. What do you say when, you know, we have some pretty specific examples here of, of immediate relief, but there's slow burns and relationship problems that don't go away over time. How, how do you respond to someone says like, I'm, I'm working on this relationship, but it seems so hard. It's, it's, I, I don't feel like I'm making progress, even though I'm bringing the willingness. What, what do you say then? Patience. One word, patience. Don't give up because you have no idea in the greater plan where the other people are to receive it. Now, you know, the Course says the other people don't have to change. First of all, there are no other people. In truth, there's only one. But in the world of form, we have many, many, many relationships, and some of them are primary, and some of them are secondary, and some of them are tertiary. We have a whole list of who's the most important to us. And when it comes to forgiveness, we pretty much know who or those who are the most important to us. I find that the ones that are the most important to us are the ones that I liked to work on in the beginning because they were so obvious. And I'm a person who likes proof, and the proof is in the doing. And then, of course, when you start to see yourself being less threatened by the other person, being less disturbed by the other person who doesn't have to change at all. For instance, we'll take a father or a mother, because those are our first people, who constantly presses our buttons, just constantly says the same thing over and over again and exhibits the same patterns that set our teeth on edge. To expect them to change, well, it's absurd. 
but for you to change your mind is necessary. So you keep on appealing to the Holy Spirit. Well, I was with him today and he still said the same thing to me. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It only takes common sense. Things like that. <laughs> Obviously, I'm speaking from long association. <laughs> uh, I always thought my father was very critical of everything that I did and I could never please him. It turned out when he lived with me and my mom at the end of his life and I could be his caregiver, I found out how wrong I was. It was his problem, never mine. He had trouble expressing love. He was never really criticizing me at all. He used that form to get the guilt maybe and project it. But as you have a relationship, it seems to go no place with all your desire, your highest willingness to perceive it as differently, to have it healed. I think the number one thing you have to remember is this person does not have to change does not have to change. I want to change the way I see this person. And I notice one of the first steps as we start to see, we'll say movement in the process, is that that person doesn't push my button so hard anymore. Maybe one out of three times instead of each time. And I find out that I can not only be in the same room with that person, but appreciate her or him for very little things. If it's a parent, for raising me and doing his best or her best, uh, for not being perfect. Goodness knows I'm not. But things like that, like I call the, the, the guilt around the edges, a little light starts to come through when you're with that person and you start to see yourself shifting very gradually when you are totally and completely ready and completely ready. And only the Holy Spirit knows when that is. Then it seems to me like a major flip. And all of a sudden, your higher willingness, perhaps, your total letting go, perhaps, or just your desire to have it healed once and for all so that you don't suffer, bam, the whole thing changes and never goes back. Why is this? I don't know why in God's plan it takes some things longer than others to be forgiven, but basically it always comes back to the same thing. What we need to forgive is ourselves. It is ourselves we need to forgive. I know when sometimes we talk about the course with people who have just come upon it and they hear the phrase about the guilt that we carry and how we project it, then they're not recognizing they have any guilt about anything. But as they go deeper and deeper into the course and actually study it, it starts to get peeled away layer by layer, like very thin onion skin, until one day you look at the shape of the onion in your mind and you realize it's about half as big as it used to be. It just gets peeled away. Forgiveness is a very quiet thing. It stands silently by and does nothing, but waits your invitation your invitation to forgiveness must be there, not I'm going to grit my teeth and try to forgive this son of a gun. But your invitation, Holy Spirit, please help me. Decide for me. Decide for me how to see this. You show me. I do not know. And you touched on something there, Judy, guilt. And there's these deep in the unconscious mind is these uh, subterranean rivers of guilt and they seem to come up every once in a while and cause drama and we project onto people this guilt. How do you, how do you think about dealing with guilt when it comes up? Cause you know, it says we're never upset for the reason we think we are yet. I, here I am projecting guilt, my guilt on somebody and believing it's real, but in fact, it's just guilt coming up from the unconscious mind. And my mind is pointing it at somebody to explain its presence, but it's really has nothing to do with the other person. How do you think about that? That's a great question, Matt. Um, I would say that this might be a couple of podcasts with different people illustrating how they deal with the guilt when they recognize it. I would say, number one, it's almost unrecognizable to us unless we go looking for it. Why? What are we feeling guilty about anyway? Imagine this. We have a very loving family, which gives us everything. We have absolutely no needs. We might say to the world, <laughs> we're living in heaven. 
And one day, for some unfathomable reason that we don't know, with our free will, we decide to leave instantly. Heaven does not exist. It never had. We are making ourselves. We were not created by God the Father, or if you want to say God the Mother, any term you want to use. We are not created by our creator. Rather, we have created ourselves. Now we're going to be on our own. Well, we're going to do a better job than this. What better job? Okay. Number one, the whole thing of the separation is a dream. God does not know of the separation. God isn't saying, where are you, my beloved son? Come back to me. God doesn't know we've gone because God is complete. We know we are gone and we are as guilty as hell. If you think of leaving that wonderful home and turning your back on everyone in it without even saying goodbye, not telling where you've gone, no thank you, no see you later, no love you, you're gone. Wouldn't you be afraid of coming back? So a lot of our fear has to do with what is God going to do to us when we return? The wonderful answer, the course tells us is nothing. God never knew you were gone to begin with. It's all been a dream. Uh, I have likened it before, and I hope I haven't done a podcast, but we've all had nightmares. Uh, sometimes we even have physical aspects of a nightmare. Our adrenaline is rushing. We're shaking. We're crying. We're all screwed up on a ball. We're tight because the dream is so terrifying. And then so terrifying, you suddenly wake up and you still have the affects of it because your body's responded to this dream. But your mind has said, oh, it was only a dream. This never really happened. The Course tells us that the Bible says, and God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. But no place in the Bible does it ever say he awakened. I think we get clues of the higher plan here and there. We get clues from something as profound as that. The Course quoting the fact that the Bible never says Adam awakened from the deep sleep to row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream, a childhood nursery rhyme. If we look and find all the clues in our culture and our past, we will see from the great mystics to the people who walk around today and bring the same kind of wisdom through different traditions. It's all around us. We are in a dream. While we're in the dream, it's very hard to recognize it. And so the more we feel this guilt and project it, it's like playing hot potato. You know, someone throws a hot potato at you, you catch it, you quickly throw it to the next person because you're not going to hold on to it. That's guilt. I don't mean in the game hot potato, it's guilt. I mean, that's very similar to the way we pass along guilt. The next person who comes along is going to get the effect of our bad mood if someone 10 minutes ago has really bothered us. But it's such a big topic, and it takes a good while to wrap your mind around what is the source of this guilt, and do you want to keep it? So we use the guilt for a lot. I'm guilty that I didn't call my mom in 17 days. Oh, you're going to know how many days it is, too. Or I'm guilty that I didn't buy the right product at the discount when I went to the supermarket when my friend, husband, lover told me to make sure you got take the coupon with you and get the discount, you know, all sorts of things. Guilt is the nemesis of peace. Guilt is where we live in this disturbed illusion. To undo guilt is only one way, and it's to ask for the help. And that's what the Holy Spirit exists for, to help us undo all these wretched thoughts spawned by guilt and help us see in the dream that we indeed are one, that love is the answer, and that we will and can go home together, not separately, because there is no separation in the oneness to which we want to be headed and where we already are, because it's a dream. In that oneness, there is no separation. There is no individuality. I know a lot of people say, but will I still be a person? Will I still know I'm me? Well, if you're offered something very, very much more than 
only knowing you are you, a feeling that goes beyond description. There is no way to be able to use, it's ineffable as Bill Thetford used to say. There is no way, there are no words to describe the higher state of the mystical experience when you feel united with God. It's still part of the dream because there's still some form to it, but it's much closer. And it happens to us in many different ways. And I'm sure many people uh, sharing this podcast with us have had those experiences, whether through a severe illness when you're unconscious or uh, a near death experience. A lot of people seem to talk about that or a drug that you use. Uh, in prayer, in quiet, spontaneously. Those experiences of closer than we are now to God stay with you, and you know that they are more true than anything else is true in your life. So don't worry too much about if it takes you a long time to have a healing with someone or even a group of people, as long as it's your intent to do so and you keep on asking for the guidance, you're going to do so. And don't worry and get all, really, your your mind turned, (laughs) except in the best way, about guilt until you read the course more thoroughly and understand finally the philosophy of why we think we're separate. And finally, you start to realize that it doesn't matter that I feel I'm separate. I know it's not true. So I choose the Holy Spirit to see it differently for me and give me that opportunity. Holy Spirit, make this decision for me. Decide for me now. I was watching a video of uh, David Hawkins, who I know you knew when he was still alive, Judy. But he he talks about uh, when you're in that moment of pain, ask yourself, what is what is it that, what's the juice I'm getting out of it? That's the word he uses, the juice. He's like, what am I, what am I getting out of feeling angry or guilty? And it's usually some story like I've been wronged and this person did this or that. And it's just the, uh, it's, I guess it's the clinging to the realness of the story and whatever the character you are in it, the victim, victimizer, or the hero of that, of that story. I think you're very right. And one time I had a discussion with him and um, this was, I believe, right after I got the course. And, you know, we all have our different ways and and we certainly respect each other's. And then we like to see where they link up. And Oh, it says it this in the Vedanta. That's exactly what it says. You know, we go on comparing, which is fine as long as it's for a higher good. Uh, And it has to do with what do you do when you're really feeling rotten? And early on with the course, I realized that there was one simple, I'll call it a trick that I could do to my mind. If I felt really rotten about myself, about someone, about a situation, about something I didn't do, all the myriad of things that make us feel bad about ourselves, I would pick up the phone and call someone I loved. Even better, if there was someone not doing well, I would call that person and give her or him love. And there's no question that every time I hung up the telephone, it was gone. I'm not saying it didn't come back in another form. That's the practice. But it was gone. And very personally, I'm sharing with you because I can't see you. (laughs) Very very personally, um, I'm in a lot of physical pain now. doesn't matter what I have, but if anyone's really interested, it's osteoarthritis. So my hands are almost crippled and I can't use them. My hands, what does that mean? My my emails, what about picking up a spoon to have my dinner? What about brushing my hair? Well, you think of all the things your hands do, but this only happened in the last few weeks. And the pain was so excruciating that I allowed myself to start taking some magic which uh, turned out to be a narcotic that the doctor gave me. And yes, it definitely diminished the pain, but what it also did was diminish my right-mindedness. 
I miss my right-mindedness so much that I decided, "Uh uh-uh, no drugs, no more drugs at all. And then I was just going to be content to suffer, right? I'm going to be suffering every minute of the day. Well, I'm busy pretty much every minute of the day doing things like you and I are doing now and sometimes in person, sometimes on the telephone, and sometimes in reading, sometimes in practice. I suddenly started to realize that when you and I are making this podcast together, I have absolutely no sense of pain. It's gone. It's not there. If I stop to think of it, and try to move my hands. Uh Oh, pain. But otherwise, I could go for an hour, two hours, six hours, and not feel pain if I'm extending love. So I would call it extending love chapter two. (laughs) You don't have to wait until you're my age to do this. Uh, It happened in other situations, of course, we do talk about on the podcast. But I thought I was pretty far along. And I realized to think that is purely egocentric. I am not pretty far along. I am along the way. And every time I find an opportunity to forgive and I feel strong enough and willing enough to ask for help in it, I'm going to feel better. Yeah. You're, how you call someone when you're not feeling good reminds me of the course quote, and I'm going to get it wrong. Whatever you feel like's lacking is what you failed to give. And right. that's, that's a hard one to hear because it's like, ah, it's up to me to uh, give what I think I don't have. And then I won't experience the lack there. <laughs> Make it really simple. The only thing you're lacking at the time is love. And that's the only thing to give. Yeah. And of course, as you know, every encounter is either an expression of love or a request for it. So every time you meet someone, you're either expressing love, or you're asking for love. And so are they. If you can say, I want only to express love, well, you're doing it then. Yeah. That person gains something too. It's the greatest gift we can give to anyone is to love them. And I'm not talking about the conventional kind of loving. I'm talking about the love we let channel through, get channel through us through the Holy Spirit, which is God's love. Yeah. Well, these are great conversations, Judy. I really enjoy them. Is there any other thoughts or ideas you have for listeners? You think we can do this forever? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think that that's probably enough for today because, look, what we're really talking about is circular. We're going over and over and over the same things. And what are we doing but teaching ourselves? So you and I have this unique opportunity to be together uh, these hours and just remind ourselves about what's important. And we we take something away from each of them because we're living in the rubric of love at this moment. Because what else have we got to do? And then we go back to what we call our regular everyday work. There is no regular everyday work. The Course says... Forgiveness is the only function meaningful in time. Forgiveness is the only function meaningful in time. So we'll get to it. That means everything else is not meaningful, so I shouldn't worry about it. Exactly. Okay. Well, that's, a great, right. that's a great place to end. Thanks, Judy. You're welcome, Matt. Thanks, you. Thanks so much for listening today. Please subscribe to Miracle Voices by hitting the subscribe button on your podcast app. If you are enjoying these conversations, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use. And lastly, please visit us at miraclevoices.org and join our newsletter so we can stay connected. Until the next podcast, I want to leave you with my favorite course quote, when you want only love, you will see nothing else. Nothing else.